Let's learn how to make endless procedurally generated levels in Unity. If you're wondering how games like Subway Surfers make levels that are seemingly infinite, this is accomplished by something called procedural generation, which I'm going to show you how to do. In the previous video, I showed you how you can make this cool curvature effect like Subway Surfers has in Unity, but in this video, I'm going to show you how you can give the illusion that your game is never ending. To make this happen, here's what we need to do. While it looks like the player is running forward, the world is actually coming to him. As the road comes to the player, new roads are being generated in the background without us being able to see. If you haven't watched the previous video, no worries, we won't be doing anything with the curving shader in this video, but I am going to remove the effect just so that it's easier to see. We'll want to be able to change the values of that curvature on a whim in the future, but we have to have this part set up first for that to make sense. So stay tuned, I'll be covering that in the next video. So the first thing that we need is a signal that tells the game when to generate a new section. To do this, I'm going to create an invisible wall so that when the player hits the wall, this will create a signal to Unity to generate a new section. We'll want to know when the player hits the wall, and for now, the player is just this little ball. However, we don't actually want the player to collide with the wall, we just want it to pass through. So we're going to create a box collider, but we're going to check is trigger. If we want to be able to instantiate this entire section in code, we'll want to turn this into a prefab so we can access it. So let's just take this whole thing and drag it into our assets folder. And we may want to have different types of triggers or spawn points in the future, so I'm going to add a tag on this invisible wall as well. I probably could name it something better, but I'm just settling on the name trigger for now. And a quick note here, if I change something in the prefab like this, just in the hierarchy view, I'm just changing it on this one particular instance, not the whole prefab. So if I want this to be applied to the entire prefab, I can either go to the parent game object and click on that little overrides button and push this to the main prefab, or I can click into the prefab itself and change it from there. So just a note, because you will want this trigger on all of your road sections. And now we have our invisible wall, we have our tags, now we need to actually do something. So I'm going to add a script on my player object to check for when the player collides with the wall. I'm just going to name it Section Trigger. With Visual Studio open, this is actually a very simple script. I just need to create a variable to store my prefab, which I will plug in on the inspector side. And then I'm just going to check if the player collides with the wall. The script in this case is on the player, so we're just checking for collision when the other object's tag is trigger. We're using on trigger enter here, since we want something to happen when the player enters that trigger zone, and we're taking in just the default arguments. So we're just going to say that when the other object's tag is trigger, instantiate the road prefab that we made. With that saved, we now see a section on the inspector side where we can drag in our road section prefab. And going into play mode, you'll see my mistake here. Hitting play, I'm just moving the player through the wall manually, so I'm not having to mess with any of the player control mechanics yet. We're just testing this functionality. And as you can see, uh, nothing happens. And that is because I forgot to add a rigid body to my player. We'll have to add a rigid body on our player because checking for collision needs physics to be there in order for that to happen. Adding a rigid body adds physics. So I'm just going to add a rigid body, but I will not be using gravity for the time being, so I'm going to uncheck that. Hitting play again, and as soon as I drag the player through our wall, you can see that a new section is instantiated. Perfect! Now we're getting somewhere. Now in a game like Subway Surfers, you would probably have several of these sections built out for the first part of the game, because we're creating this illusion that this is never ending. Of course, in our little game right here, we can still see everything very clearly, but with a little curvature, a little scenery, and a little fog, players won't know what hit them. But we still have a problem, because our platform isn't instantiating in a place that makes sense. We want it to instantiate behind our other platforms. So luckily, if we go back to our script, we can specify exactly where we want this to spawn. The instantiate declaration can take in three parameters if we want it to. Right now, we just have it instantiating the one road section, but we can also tell it where. 
So we can change this to tell it to instantiate the road section, add in a new vector three. I'm just using zero, zero and negative 57 because this is where the platform initially overlaps the first one. You can play around with this and put in your own values if you want to. And then we also need to tell it what rotation the game object needs to spawn in at. So we're just saying quaternion.identity, which means no rotation at all. Now we're cooking. Hitting play again, and we can see that as the ball passes through, the new prefab spawns in the right place. To make this work in practice, we have to have the platforms actually move on their own instead of me dragging the player through the trigger. So we're going to go to our prefab object and add another script that will slowly move the platform towards the player. Clicking into our script and opening up Visual Studio, we're going to want to put this in the update function so that we're checking the position every frame and adding a small value each time. To change the object's position over time, we're going to want to access the object's transform component. So we're going to say transform.position plus equals because we want to add a little value each time. New vector three. And I only want to move this along the z-axis, so I'm going to put 0, 0, and 3 in there. So each frame, we'll be checking the object's current position and adding 3 along the z-axis. And then we're going to multiply it by time dot delta time. This essentially equalizes the speed and experience. The update method checks every frame, and depending on your computer, your frame rate could be faster or slower. So if you have a fast computer, this functionality could look very different than if you have a slow computer and time.delta time kind of equalizes that for everyone. Now we can see that our platforms are moving and while our script is working, it's now spawning farther away because I didn't take into account the moving of the platform when I set my initial spawn point. To correct this, I'm going to pause my game, adjust the platform and take note of where it should overlap. And it looks like negative 35 is a good place to start. Then I'll update that number in my code as well. You could pull this value out if you wanted to, but since the trigger is tied to the object, it doesn't matter how fast the platform is going, the spawn effect will always happen where it needs to. So if I speed it up a little, uh, you can see that this still works as intended. You'll need this because if you want to speed up your game as the player progresses to make the game harder, this will allow you to do that. And now we have working procedural generation but we still have one tiny problem, and that's all of these kind of ghost platforms that we don't need anymore behind our player. There's no sense in keeping these, and they'll weigh down your game because your computer will still have to devote energy to keeping them around. So we can do the same thing that we did earlier and create an invisible wall to destroy these platforms. This doesn't have to be a prefab since we'll only need one of these, but I'll create a new game object, add a box collider just like we did earlier, Again, click is trigger, and then I will create a tag named destroy. Clicking into the move script on our road prefab, we can write a similar function as we did earlier. We'll say void on trigger enter and take in the default arguments. This is void because we're not returning any value with this function. And then we'll just say if the other game objects tag is destroy, destroy the game object that this script is on which is the road. So anytime a platform collides with the destroy wall, destroy that object. If we go back to the inspector view, we can see that once again, I have forgotten to add a rigid body to my game object. So I'm going to go into my prefab, add a rigid body, and we definitely don't want to use gravity on this one. And as soon as we do that, now we have some really cool procedural generation. The really cool thing about procedural generation is that you can gradually make levels harder by adding speed, increasing the density of objects, adding different types of objects, and so much more. But in the next episode, I'll teach you how to change your shader graph values by incorporating what we just learned today. Hope to see you there.